So welcome to today's event, everybody. I'm Jackie Jones from Herefordshire Green Network, and we are delighted to be hosting today's event in cooperation with Herefordshire Council. Next slide, please, Rosie. We're going to be hearing about some of the work going on at county level across Herefordshire to act on climate, biodiversity, and other environmental issues. We'll have a brief scene setting introduction from Richard Vaughan, who's Sustainability and Climate Change Manager at Herefordshire Council. We'll also be hearing briefly from two members of the board, Steve Klink and Rebecca Tully, uh, who I'll introduce more fully later. And the final speaker will be Councillor Alyssa Swingerhurst, Swingerhurst, sorry, Alyssa, Cabinet Member for the Environment and also a member of the uh, HCNP board. Our main speaker today, though, is the chair of the board, uh, James Marsden, who's been chair for almost a year, I think. James's background is in policy and his passion is for the natural environment. James has over 30 years experience of evidence and policy analysis, advice, advocacy, environmental law, governance, habitat ecology, conservation management. Uh, he's currently a member of the Office of Environmental Protection's College of Experts. In the past, he's been a specialist advisor for the Environmental Audit Committee. Um, he's former director, various roles, but a director of land management strategy at Natural England. And he's been a board member for various organizations, including Brecon Beacons National Park, Saban I Brecheniog, I've done my best. Uh, and Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. And now he's a maker of cider and perry. We'll be hearing from James in a moment, but first I'd like to hand over to Richard Vaughan. Richard, over to you. Good afternoon, all, and Jackie, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you to Herefordshire Green Network for co-hosting this event today. My name is Richard Vaughan. I manage the sustainability and climate change team at Herefordshire Council. Uh, and Herefordshire Council declared a climate emergency in March of 2019, and this was expanded to recognise the twin emergencies. It was expanded to a climate and ecological emergency in December of 2020. We recognise that the council is only about 1% of the emissions of the county, and so Herefordshire Council can't do this alone. Partnership working is going to be absolutely key to delivering progress on this countywide ambition that we have. So the Herefordshire Climate and Nature Partnership Board was founded in November of 2021. The Cabinet Member for Environment, Councillor Alyssa Swinglehurst, has a seat on the board, and my team provides the Secretariat support to the board. Uh, the, the Climate and Nature Partnership Board has gone on to, do a, uh, to host a number of events, and they continue to do so, so please do keep an eye out for future events. And they've initiated and they're delivering a range of projects with the aims of achieving our shared goals. Uh, so more of which you'll, you'll hear about today. Greener Footprints is a Herefordshire Council initiative. You might have seen the logo on the front screen. Uh, this was a recommendation that came off the back of the Climate Citizens Assembly, and that was to support the county's response to climate and nature emergencies by connecting with local groups and organisations, working with businesses, signposting residents uh, to support and advice, and also supporting the Herefordshire Climate and Nature Partnership Board and their projects. I'd really like to thank all the members of the Herefordshire Climate and Nature Partnership Board. They're volunteers and they give their time freely and their commitment to the board is fantastic. And without them, we wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be hearing about all the exciting work that they've been up to. So that's it from me. Thank you to everyone for joining and I look forward to the session today. Back to Jackie. Thanks very much. Um, we'll now hear, be hearing from James. So, James, please start your presentation. Jackie, uh, thank you very much, uh, and particularly to the Green Network for this opportunity. It's long overdue. Jackie suggested it um, several months back, and I'm delighted that we've been able to bring this webinar forward to the, 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 the group and to have such great attendance. And thanks to Sir Richard for his introduction. Can I have the next slide? Just to say a little bit about who we are and what we do. Richard's already mentioned the vision, a thriving net zero carbon nature rich heritage by 2030. Hugely ambitious. And I'll say a little bit more about the challenges ahead in a number of future slides. 
Critically, we're an inclusive board. We're open to all. It's a partnership um, across everybody, uh, including all of you on the webinar today who are interested and concerned um, to help us achieve the vision. The board is a, a wide ranging and really now tight knit team. We have architects who understand building and particularly green building in Ellie Deacon Smith and Emily Partridge. We have ENGOs, environmental NGOs represented by the Wildlife Trust, Jamie Orsley and Claire Kingston, the National Trust. We have representatives from business, Gareth Williams, formerly Kapler. Uh, we have energy experts, obviously Gareth again, Jackie and Gordon Coppock, I think is on, on the call. We have the arts represented in Philip Treacy from uh, courtyard and of course we have farmers and Steve is going to be saying a little bit later and we also have Ian Howie former fund manager um, and journalist so it's it's a wide-ranging team across experts enablers um, and emitters as well as the community and I haven't mentioned Rebecca who we're going to hear from uh, a little later as well and I'm going to put her in the sort of community box but she she's a specialist in the food area, which is so important and represents the Food Alliance. We have an action plan, which hopefully at our next meeting, we're about to sign off and you're gonna see a little bit of that later, looking across the six big sectors, buildings, energy, farming, land use, food, farming, transport, and waste. And we have access to a small fund of um, money um, for which we can commission projects through the council. Next slide, please. I mentioned partnership, that's fundamental to all that we do. Our role fundamentally is to use soft power. That's all we have, but we can coordinate and integrate. We can convene and mobilize others. We can enable and facilitate joint working across the plethora of other groups, and there are quite a lot. Um, but we don't actually deliver stuff ourselves other than through the projects we do, but we can and are beginning to do hold others to account against the targets. Fundamentally, we're about open, honest, transparent and evidence based dialogue and reporting. And this webinar is part of an evolving approach to engagement uh, more widely. Um, you'll see um, that uh, we intend to hold an assembly. Well, this is part of that evolving approach to engagement. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the big picture. Uh, the Climate Change Act of 2008 establishes the legal duty for net zero by 2050 at a UK level. And the Climate Change Committee, set up to advise government, has produced a series of carbon budgets that are designed to take the UK towards that 2050 target. Those of you that are avid today listeners will have heard um, day before, yes, well, it was yesterday, 28th February, that the Climate Change Committee had written to the government to say, well done, um, third carbon budget covering the period 2018 to 2022 was actually successfully met and slightly exceeded. But please don't use the slack, was the message from the Climate Change Committee, to think that you can go slow on subsequent carbon budgets, because if you do, you'll miss the 2030 targets. This budget on the slide is longer term. This is looking beyond on the trajectory from 20, sorry, 1990 through 2018, which is the budget we've just finished, into the future. And Climate Change Committee recommends four big things. More of us must take up low carbon solutions. UK electricity production needs to be zero carbon by 2035. We have to reduce demand for carbon intensive activities. And that includes our diets. And we're gonna to have to transform farming and land use. I'm going to say quite a bit more about that in a subsequent slide. But 
the broad consensus is that somewhere between um, 20% and maybe a bit more uh, is going to have to um, shift to other land uses out of agricultural production to meet current policy targets for net zero and nature recovery. And just touching on that, it, this is difficult, but I'm going to give you some more stats. If you think about UK land use, 71% is agricultural land. In Herefordshire, it's around 80%. 85% of that farmland is used to rear animals, but meat and dairy and eggs provide only 32% of UK calories, whereas 15% of farmland is used to grow crops for human consumption, providing 68% of our calories. So there's a clear issue here, and I, I can touch on food security and other elements of this perhaps in questions. I just want to plant that thought that there is scope for that shift out of current, more intensive agricultural land use towards something different. And it's happening, as Steve will begin to talk about later. Next slide. So you'll see here, these are the territorial emissions for Herefordshire from a baseline of 2022. On the left, um, you can see the light blue um, bottom segment. Those are the territorial emissions for industry and commercial buildings and uses. The orange is us, our homes, domestic buildings. Smaller segment is agriculture. That's the energy use in agriculture. And then the big chunk of dark blue, the biggest segment in that um, pie chart is transport. Move now across to the right. If you include the emissions from livestock, that picture changes. So the four big things are industrial and commercial buildings, housing, transport, and agriculture. Those are the things we have to shift to get towards net zero by 2030, or perhaps overshoot beyond towards 2050. Next slide. But we can't just look at territorial emissions. We have to look at our consumption emissions. These are the things that all of us are buying, eating, using. And if we look at that, we can see that, again, there's a bit of a mirror to be seen. Our purchase of goods, um, what we buy, what we eat, the second column, meat and fish. And fundamentally, look at housing, look at the role of oil in Herefordshire's consumption emissions. This is because we're a highly rural county, so this is going to be difficult to fix because many houses are old, they're off grid. And then look at private transport. There are quite a lot of flights there, not a lot of public transport, and quite a lot of private transport. So there are clearly some things that we can do. What might those be? Buy and consume less. Eat a bit less meat and fish, perhaps no more than three days a week. Um, clearly generating where we can and exporting electricity from solar PV on our roofs, using electricity only from renewable sources at home. Those are some ideas of what we can all do. Um, and the shift and out of flights isn't too difficult if you're able to, to catch a train. And certainly Jackie and I are doing quite a lot in Europe at the moment. Next slide. I want now to give a similar big picture on nature. This is every bit as difficult. Government's ambition, uh, stated ambition, is to leave the environment in England in a better state. Yet England has one of the most nature depleted countries. It is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Just look at those UK statistics, um, decline across a suite of species of 19% since 1970. But if you look at farmland birds, the decline of breeding birds on farmland is 60% since 1970. And that decline is continuing, albeit the decline 
the rate of decline has slowed since the mid teens of this century as a result of the agri-environment scheme take up. But the Office of Environmental Protection, and I declare an interest there because I have an association with them as a member of their College of Experts, they reported in January that government is largely off track to meet its environmental ambitions. So we know we have a huge hill to climb. However, there's lots of good news coming out of Herefordshire. Um, the local nature recovery strategy, which was mandated by statutory guidance published in March of last year, um, that is underway, led by the council as the responsible authority. There's a steering group with um, Environment Agency, Natural England, um, Farming Interests, uh, the Environment Agency I've already mentioned, and others on board. Um, they report regularly um, at the Local Nature Partnership. We've got a meeting coming up later this month when no doubt we'll hear more. But one of the things that excited me most, and I'm sure Steve will touch on this as well, in terms of the shift that we're seeing in farmers' attitudes, look at that. Um, 87% willing to make changes to reduce the phosphate that's entering our rivers. 72% are delivering environmental stewardship schemes. Now, that was just 13% of the farms in Herefordshire, but it was 24% of the farmed land. Now, Steve and I have an ambition to grow that 13% to at least 80% of Herefordshire farms. And um, we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to get there. So... The other big thing that happened last year in November was the success of the landscape recovery application for, and that's an agri-environment scheme, for the River Wye. 36 farmers are going to be supported over 20 years to recover nature, reduce phosphate and sequester carbon across 4,500 hectares of riverside land. That's between just above Herefordshire and um the wide Valley Gorge. There is also another landscape recovery scheme centered around Mocus that's been led by the Duchy. So we've got two of the new landscape recovery schemes in the county, and that's a huge success and gives us great optimism. Next slide. I want to touch quickly on um, the national targets within which the work to develop the local nature recovery strategy sits. These targets stem from five things, really. The Environment Act of 2021 and the statutory regulations that flow from those published in 2023. The Global Biodiversity Framework of December 22 that came out of the Conference of Parties number 15. The Environmental Improvement Plan of 2023. And the guidance that DEFRA issued in December of last year on the delivery of 30 by 30. 30 by 30 is the acronym for the Global Biodiversity Framework obligation to protect 30% of land and sea for nature by 2030. And that's an international treaty obligation signed by UK government. The map you see on the right of this slide is the map published by DEFRA on the 9th of December last year. It shows in red the sites of special scientific interest, national nature reserves that are currently protected for nature, but only 50% of those are actually in favourable condition or thereabouts. The areas in blue are the so called protected landscapes, national parks areas of outstanding national beauty that they were formerly known as are the areas in blue. And so DEFRA is saying that the red and the blue potentially will get us to 30% of land protected for nature by 2030. But the management is the key. The other targets are really important too. The apex target, halting the kind in species abundance by 2030, We've got to know what they are, where they are, and what habitats they depend upon. Restoring 75% of our SSIs to favourable condition by 2042, as I've said, 50% or thereabouts are in unfavourable condition at the moment. The landscape recovery projects, well, we've got two already covering probably 
our fair share. But the wildlife rich habitat to be created outside of protected sites is a huge challenge. The way in which these targets are envisaged to be delivered is by paying farmers through the environmental land management schemes to make the changes that will need to be made to contribute to those targets. The government view is that farmers will contribute at least 50% of the protected sites target and create more than 80% of the 500,000 hectares of wildlife rich habitat outside of those protected sites by 2042. This is hugely challenging for farmers who are under all sorts of other pressures from the market um, and energy and what's happening in Ukraine, amongst others. So the expectation is from government that 65 to 80 percent of landowners and farmers will adopt nature friendly farming on at least 10 to 15 percent of their land by 2030. Wow. Well, it's our job through the work of Steve's Farming and Land Use subgroup to get us to that place. Next slide. And um, this is, I think, my last one of this section of the talk, because I just wanted to give you a, 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 an insight to what the targets that I've touched on in my last one might look like for Herefordshire. There's clearly no wriggle room on that first one, halting the decline in species abundance by 2030, because it's a legal obligation. It's set down in statute. Herefordshire is not immune from that. It's going to have to happen across the entire country. There is some discretion around some of these other targets, though, and that's where the work of the local nature um, recovery strategy process kicks in because the what, where, how, with whom, by when of the debatable targets is going to be delivered locally through that process, which will be fully consulted upon. But somehow, you take um, 50,000 hectares for nature, how do I get to that? Well, 30% of the county, 218,000 hectares, that's the county area, roughly 30%, plus the existing protected sites and heritage wildlife reserves, you get to needing to find another 50,000 hectares to give you a total of 62,500 hectares. It won't end up like that. It will be delivered through the LNR best process um, in terms of the what, where. The up-to-date condition assessment by S of SSIs, that's natural ingress responsibility, ditto putting the management actions in place for 75% of SSIs by 2042. There's no wriggle room on that at all, and government is going to have to resource Natural England to deliver that target for us, working with landowners and farmers. The restoring habitat outside of SSIs by 2042 target is derived by taking the 48 counties in England, so we're one of them, divide the national target by 48, and you get 11,900 hectares. That's an environmental improvement plan target, again, to be delivered through the local nature recovery strategy. The last one, well, I reckon we've got a jolly good chance of knocking that one on the head and achieving it through the two um, landscape recovery project that I've mentioned already. But critically, this is going to need to happen mostly on farmland. And that's the challenge ahead of us to deliver for nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, we're going to be moving on to hear from Steve Clank in a moment, as James has said. But thank you, James, for the giving us the national context and some of those really important numbers that we're trying to reach. And nobody's pretending at all that this isn't challenging. It's anything but, um, as are the other areas that are being covered by um, in the work of the Climate and Nature Partnership Board and beyond. Steve, please um, 
do introduce yourself. I should say Steve's background is in agriculture, so he's really, really well placed to um, present on this subject. He's um, co-chair, as you see, of Farm Herefordshire, uh, membership member of the Climate and Nature Partnership Board, and he's chairing the Land Use and Farming subgroup. Uh, Steve, over to you. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name's Steve Clink, um, Chair of Farm Herefordshire, Co-Chair and Member of the Climate Board. I was a farm manager responsible for about 3,000 acres in North Herefordshire for the last 33 years um, before I retired. Um, so, sort of hope I know a little bit about farming and the um, difficulties that it faces. Um, and maybe because I was the farm manager, I always felt that I was just a custodian of the land and uh, had to look after it for the short time that I was in control of it and always wanted to leave it in a better place than um, I found it. Um, but anyway, as a board, um, or the, the subgroup, we just we set out three uh, priorities, and those were um, to reduce carbon, to um, both in the amount that's produced and but increase the amount sequestered into land by better farming practices, and to increase the amount of on-farm energy that's produced. Um, we wanted to try and encourage reduction of nutrient um, and phosphate is the one that is really in the spotlight at the moment but I don't think it's the only one um, and there's a lot going on with reducing phosphates currently um, and then also to promote nature friendly farming um, and to help with improving uh, the species and numbers of species uh, within Herefordshire. Um, so just on the nutrient reduction, I think um, we have had Lancaster University in their refocus report have shown uh, that there has been a big surplus of phosphate within the Y catchment and I think Avara and Noble Foods um, should be congratulated uh, in their actions of exporting chicken litter from the catchment. And that will certainly reduce the phosphate balance. It won't turn the water around um, very quickly because a lot of that phosphate is sold in soil and will take time to either be farmed out of the system or to wash through want of a better word. Um, but as a, a board, I'm very grateful that Ian Howey set up, my, who was previous chairman, set up and got funding for 40 farms to be audited. Uh, that happened, has happened in the last 12 months. And the results from those 40 audits um, of Herefordshire Farms has, has actually been quite encouraging when you look at it compared to the national picture. Most of them are a bit below, whether you look at it in tons of produce or kilos of produce or um, carbon per hectare that is produced. That's not to say there's not um, further to go with that. Um, those carbon audits, those 40 farms will in 2026 be remeasured just to see what progress has been made, if any, and hopefully there will be some. Um, so what we want to do now, that 40% is only about 2% of the farms in the county. Uh, and to try and get a figure on how many other farms have had a carbon audit is really quite difficult. The companies that do these audits don't uh, log them by county. Um, but uh, 
So there will be other farms that have done them on their own back. And certainly the duchy have had most of their farms done, which would be another one and a half percent. Um, but we can't actually tell how many others. Um, the next thing we want to do is to have workshops for those 40 and to invite other farmers to come along so that they can see, they could, the 40 can understand what their reports show. And also for the for new people that don't know about carbon auditing to come in and see what the benefits to their businesses could be. Um, and the other thing I would just like to say that is I really think it's important that the whole farm is audited, not just one um, one part of the farm. A lot of suppliers now um, are asking for farm audits on, say, their beef cattle. But it's it's much better to look at the whole farm rather than just one, one aspect. Um, James briefly touched on food and food production and the difficulties that we have in trying to get people to, um, to can't change the way they farm. Um, but if you think that in 1950, UK had a population of 50.4 million, and today we're at 67.9 million, and all those people need to be fed. So farms for that period have been encouraged to produce as much food as they possibly can. Um, and they've actually done a, a pretty good job. Uh, there has been some things that in hindsight, you know, probably shouldn't have been done, pulling out hedgerows, um, filling in ponds, taking out woodlands. Um, and that some of that needs to be put back. Um, but we still do need to feed people and that shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, the catch phrase at the moment is public money for public good. And farmers have since 1947 Agriculture Act have had public money um, and the public good was to produce food. It, it's changed somewhat now, and that's quite right that it should. So I just thought it would be useful to know what the restrictions and barriers are to farmers taking up these measures. Well, firstly, they're businesses and they have to make a profit. And one measure of sustainability is actually just staying in business. That means making a profit. So as far as planting trees goes, um, if, if you want somebody to plant a field of trees, they have to be compensated for that in some way because uh, you will devalue the land by about 50%. And somebody has to be paid for that. Um, reducing fertilizer use potentially risks a reduced yield. And uh, as far as carbon goes, that could mean the carbon balance is actually greater per tonne of food produced. Um, taking land out of production for nature schemes is, at the moment, is very attractive for some of the options that are available. But a lot of these schemes are only there for three years. So people don't have uh, confidence that it will be there again in three years when it comes around, which is why the Elms, the Land Scape Recovery is really, really good. A 20 year programme of guaranteed funding uh, is, is what people really need. But I did just want to look end by looking at positives. So my own experience was we had 10% um, of our farm uh, in various schemes, wild bird feed, pollen and nectar mixes, buffer strips, which connected areas, um, wildflower areas, um, we had fields that we uh, managed to encourage lapwing nesting, and that was actually very successful. And the farm was managed regeneratively. Now, that, that's a sort of fairly loose term. It doesn't have um, set definitions of what regenerative farming is. Um, 
we've reduced fertilizers and we've reduced for uh, cultivations um i I'm, I'm a bear of little brain but um and i wish i'd done a baseline study when we started farming in that way um but what i discovered was that we actually by doing those things brought live um we increased farmland birds we increased wildlife generally and my own feeling is that we created a a healthy soil that was full of uh, bacteria and fungi and the soil was working um, we didn't need to put phosphate on because the plants themselves were mining phosphate and making it available um, and we had an enormous amount of wildlife we had six pairs of nesting barn owls we had loads of hares we had lots of uh, we had lapwings um, skylarks, loads of birds. And so for me, the answer is under your feet. It's in the soil. And if you look after the soil, then uh, all things are possible. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Steve. And um, it's really lovely to hear about the farm that you were managing and the sort of transformation you you had there. Um, to know how that how how that can be, but it's also interesting how very much at the moment seems to be whether it's in farming or a lot of the sorts of steps that we need to take um, down to individual choice within a system that may or may not be supportive. So really good to hear about. 20 year um, structure of the ELM system rather than what I call traffic light policy, red, green, red, green, and you never know what will happen next. Um, we've had a few questions in, but we'll hold on to them for now. Um, we do know what's going to happen next, at least I think so, which is that we'll be hearing from Rebecca Tully. So next slide, please. Here you are. Um, Rebecca is coordinator of the Herefordshire Food Alliance, which is doing absolutely great things, um, and is chair of the food subgroup. Uh, over to you, Rebecca. Hello, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Give somebody give me one thumb. Lovely, I can see a thumb. Um, um, I made the mistake of having a look at the uh, chat, and so there's a couple of things in there that have, um, distracted me but uh, I hope to kind of include them as well because obviously there's lots of things that have been said that are relatable to food um, but I will I'll I'll crash on with with what I was going to start by saying so we are um, Herefordshire Food Lights the broad alliance that is also part of a national uh, sustainable food places network um, it's really uh, great that it's part of something that's more national because it does mean that we can um, uh, kind of save reinventing wheels and a lot of things and learn an awful lot from our partners especially across uh, similar areas to us and there's a lot of conversations that happen in the marches area on this we are um, also able to tap into the support and the deadlines that enabled us to get uh, for the whole county so this is a whole county thing a bronze award sustainable food places um, within the last year partly funded independent broad uh, alliance partly funded at the moment by public health um uh and that was part of the uh, public health kind of mission was to go to, down this sustainable food places um, route so we're able to do that um we've got obviously really overlapping aims the alliance has got really overlapping aims with the climate and nature partnership board um and but we are more than that. So we've got kind of six aims that align with the sustainable food places and quite a lot of that is, uh, so it's around access to food and food, kind of building economies around food and, um, oh, I've got my, anyway, uh, <laughs> six different aims and in Herefordshire actually seven because um, farming and waste are much more, uh much bigger in a, uh in a lot of ways than they are in other areas so we've um 
we the alliance has got quite a, a broad uh remit and part of that is also being part of this food subgroup and i think that one of the um successes of the climate nature partnership board is actually the fact that they started as two separate things and these things now um have uh, mirrored priorities so the three priorities i'm going to talk about are the food subgroup priorities of the climate and nature uh, partnership board and that's essentially something that's been able to happen with a broad um board board looking at zero carbon nature rich um um across the county uh, so the three that we're kind of looking at at the moment that are part of those 18 aims that um james mentioned Building demand, meeting demand. So food that is produced locally in ways that support net zero and nature recovery. There's a conversation, there's constant conversations around what that means. And um, there's work to be done to kind of develop that as a criteria, I think. But essentially building that demand and meeting it um, for that locally produced food, which touches on quite a lot of the um, things that people have have shared in the chat that's around shortening supply chains and around waste actually because um feeding people uh feeding a larger number of people often uh, you know the amount of waste that we've produced has also increased in the last um 50 years as well um to do with our systems um so yeah a lot of use and the, some of the uh potential around that as as a board is that we can have conversations so uh, we can talk about what the land use uh, subgroup is is doing and try to overlap that and look at how we're able to um, kind of manage those things together. And um, uh, so for one thing that Steve was talking about, about those workshops, one thing would be that I would possibly say, oh, can I come and have a um, have a look at one of those workshops and see what's going on there so that I can then talk from a food perspective to other people about the um the positives that are being um being achieved in farming and so a lot of the conversations i have are about telling other people what telling people what other people are doing um uh the second uh, point that uh we're looking at is procurement so supporting uh some of the larger bodies um who procure food in the county to do more of that with shorter supply chains and with nature uh rich food the some of the issues around that 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 you know we can get to grips with as an as an alliance is just trying to unpick who's responsible for those things what the potential is you know how are we is are we tied into something that means we can't do anything but where where is there potential for change and how can we do it so that's some of the work that needs to get done um in the next while um the stuff that's great again kind of linked link to building demand and meeting demand so the stuff that's that's going on that's great how do we make sure that that goes on the map what even what map are we even talking about how do we make sure that people get found who are uh producing great food in Herefordshire and how do we tell that story about what producing great food what does the, the answer under your feet as Steve said like how do we make sure that story gets told so people know and understand um, and uh, that's something that we're working on as well. So, you know, mapping it, but also making sure we can communicate it. Um, another thing is around food waste. And that's another thing where, where you know, we look to catalyze something to happen. So there are, there are, there are things that are, are going on that are outside of our control, but what, what is within our control and how can we um, make those changes happen so that you know, everybody has their food waste collected or everybody is able to compost their food waste uh, in Herefordshire, for example. Uh, and as I think I've said the whole way through, the 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 key for me feels like it's about seeing those links. So the, the ability for us to have a, a food subgroup that also is aware and linked to what's going on in land and energy and transport feels like a really positive thing. Um, there are challenges as well. So the challenge for me with all of this stuff is about uh, the juggling the doing with the talking, the doing the thing with the talking about the thing. And then obviously also 
getting the money to continue doing the thing and also to be able to you know feed ourselves and uh house ourselves etc while we're doing it so there was a real juggle um, around how we managed to make all of that happen um but it seems to me that the the collaboration that's happening in this board is at least a way of trying to do something okay I think that's me Thanks so so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Yes, the juggling. Um, I think uh, if I ask everyone to put up their hands if they're juggling, we get a lot of hands going up. Uh, and that's the point, isn't it? We can't just take time to sit down and make a giant master plan. We actually have to get on with something now, even if um, funds aren't there, even if um, plans aren't detailed. Just getting on, getting on is grand. Lovely. Um, well, we've heard from two of the subgroups now from the um, land management and farming and from the um, food subgroup. We're now going to hand back to James. I think James is going to touch on some of the um, other activity that's less land-based um, and then we'll move on. Over to you, James. Jackie, thank you. And particular thanks to Steve and Rebecca for sharing uh, their thoughts on the top three priorities for food and for farming and land use. Uh, we might come back to that, I hope, in, in discussion because it's a really complex set of challenges that they've outlined in relation to the national context I shared earlier. I want to move on now to talk about uh, quickly about the other four sectors. And I'm um, I'll start with buildings. I'm not going to go through everything that's on the slide because you're going to get these. Our building subgroup is led by our two architects, Ellie and Emily, but ably and uh, amply supported by Jackie and occasionally me. Um, and what we've come up with really is the idea that we've got to make a shift towards zero carbon buildings. That will need some regulation. Hopefully one day we'll see that reflected in the building regs. We need critically an advice hub for new and retrofit zero carbon buildings, and we need to support retrofit skills training. And there's some of that already happening at the wonderful NMITE facility in Hereford. How will we measure progress? Well, the number of new buildings that are zero carbon, the number of existing buildings that we can retrofit. We need to set a trajectory and see that rise against those sorts of indicators. And critically, obviously, we also need a switch to low carbon heating away from oil and gas, more towards renewables. I touched on the challenges of that later, and that's a neat link into energy. Um, the subgroup there, led by Gordon Coppock, I think is on the webinar today, so please feel free to um, pose questions that um, perhaps Jackie can route to Gordon on the detail. But the big ticket are around uh, items are getting the electricity grid fit um, for the challenges of more locally based generation and demand, increasing public acceptance of renewables, by which in Herefordshire I mean primarily solar and wind, and creating a local energy uh, action plan. And let's not go through those progress indicators, they're fairly obvious. Um, but critically, we need to see the grid capacity increased, energy generation increased, but particularly energy generated from renewable sources. Then on transport and waste, these are led substantially for us by the council because they're actually council functions. Uh, but the council is doing a sterling job. In my own parish of Much Marker, we now have the Daffodil Line bus, um, which didn't exist 18 months, two years ago. And it provides a fundamentally important local link. And this idea of supporting existing services at risk and making sure there's a core network to encourage a shift from private transport mode to public really matters and ensuring the interchanges are smooth and effective. Giving segregated cycle lanes of pedestrian coppings a boost. But the council, again, is doing some splendid things on its own land and has a clear target to put 100 EV charge points on council-owned land by the end of 24-25. That's um, the financial year 
we're about to move into after April. And with Alyssa on the call, I'm going to say, I hope they're going to be fast chargers, not the ones that take all night or day. On waste, um, the council is doing an heroic job. A new contract is about to be let for uh, waste. And the key measures there are reducing the residual waste from households and increasing the rates of recycling. So if I can now move on to just headline a number of the successes that we as a board claim in partnership with others. So let's, let's have the next slide, please. So in the two and a half years that we've existed, we've agreed the grid, the three by six of priority actions, and I hope we'll sign that off uh, later this month at our next meeting. We've started some work on targets and um, identifying how we will measure progress against those targets and the actions that will deliver them. We've got a number of projects that have been funded through the Climate Reserve Fund held by Heritage Council. And we've begun to engage effectively, I hope, with some key stakeholders, both the workshops that have happened on carbon, today's event, and a number of other events that we've um, sought to reach out across the people of Herefordshire to engage around our vision. Specifically, 42 business energy audits have been completed and the companies that have done these have been super excited um, about the results of those. And I, I'm aware of a number of those companies that are now delivering some significant savings to bottom line as a result of the work that has come off the back of energy audits. Steve has touched on the farm carbon audits and he and I are hand in glove on this. This is really important because Herefordshire's farms contribute 22% of our climate change emissions and we need to bring that down otherwise net zero by 2030 or 2050 just ain't gonna happen. So encouraging more farms to take it up and then following through. So we're going to follow up those audits in 2026 and hopefully fund some more in the coming years. And then the renewable energy mapping contract was let and overseen and led by Gordon Coppock, who chairs our energy subgroup. Terrific piece of work. It's reported at the end of last year. We'll soon make that mapping public. And this is an in, going to be an indicative tool for where renewables could be placed without impacting nature recovery, landscape, heritage assets, etc. And obviously, any development that is brought forward will be subject to the planning process. Next slide, and I think that's my last one before we do a baton pass to Alyssa. What we've also been doing as a board is to contribute to the countywide strategy development. And so we have been involved in the adaptation the climate change adaptation strategy that was published earlier this year in January. We were quite heavily involved. We had presentations and some of us contributed individually as well. And we had a board discussion about the strategy. Several of us engaged in the council's core strategy local plan uh, review, still subject to consultation. So if anybody wants to have their say on that, you still can. And I mentioned the local nature recovery strategy, the Nature Recovery Network Opportunity Mapping contract is part of that process, led by Liz Dubley, who I think is also on the webinar and possibly may take some questions if she's able to about that process. That contract's underway. That is the mirror to the energy opportunity mapping. It will signal where we can put that new habitat creation, habitat restoration in place across the county in a joined up connected way. These initiatives that are in the second part of that slide, I'm less familiar with, and uh, I simply leave them with you, but perhaps Jackie Richard might chip in and, and say a little bit about those points. Thanks, James. Um, yes, Richard, I think Richard I do. Uh, yes, Richard is with us, and Richard, I think... I if yeah, grand. 
Um, if you, Richard, or I think Ben Boswell has also joined us, if one of you would like to say something about the um, 30 for 2030 business initiative, I think that would be, this would be a good time if, if you're willing to summarise that. Yeah, very happy to. So we were looking to work with 30 businesses, although I'm pleased to say we exceeded that target to help them understand um, how reducing their carbon and importantly their energy consumption and therefore costs can help them as a business. So understanding that businesses are under pressure, they haven't necessarily got dedicated sustainability colleagues to do this work. How can we best support them to help them understand their energy consumption and in turn reduce their operating costs because of the, the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis that we were going through at the time? And therefore also their carbon emissions. So it, it was a bit of a win-win really. So we were providing energy audits to those businesses to help them understand what that looked like and help them understand importantly the next steps and what they can do to achieve that. And those audits included an outline of, of what that business case looks like. So, okay, if I do invest a little bit of money here, how quickly will that pay back? How much money will I save each year? As well as, of course, how much carbon can I save? So that was a really great initiative that was running last year. And uh, yeah, very pleased to support that one. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And are you able to say anything about the follow through? Um, if there's any follow ongoing su support for those businesses or, you know, can they come back and get additional support? Hey. Very good plug. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, absolutely. So I'm really pleased to say there's currently a grant scheme running. So if any of you are business owners do have a look at the Marches Energy Grant, it's running across the Marches, as you might imagine. It's being led by our partners in Worcestershire and uh, Herefordshire businesses are eligible to apply for this. It's, it's primarily focused at SMEs. And if you've already got an audit through the 30 for 2030 business initiative, then that's fine. You can simply apply for up to 40% grant funding for eligible um, uh, retrofit um, energy efficiency measures, essentially. Um, and if you haven't got an audit already, you can actually get a free audit through the March's Energy Grant Scheme. So that support is there for businesses in the county. If you're interested in reducing your energy consumption, your energy costs, working smarter, working more efficiently, that grant is out there. Just Google March's Energy Grant and you should find it pretty much straight away. But if you're struggling, contact us on Climate and you'll get a free audit and you can get up to 40% grant funding, depending on which measures you're looking to install. Uh, and that's running now. Terrific, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, James, do you want to come back at, at this stage or shall we hand over to Alyssa? Hearing nothing from James, who I muted. Um, so I think I'll say a huge thank you to, Sorry, to James. No. Oh, I, I, I wanted. I simply wanted to say baton pass to Alyssa. Grand. Good. Thank you, James. That's super. Well, we'll be hearing. We've got quite a few questions coming through. Um, so let me hand over now to um, Alyssa Swinglehurst. And I think Alyssa, you're going to be giving a perspective from the um, from your position as cabinet member for the environment. So please uh, let me hand over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Jackie. Yes, yeah, so that'll just be a, a, an overview of some of the things that the council uh, is doing. Um, and I want to also say um, thanks, James, for, for your talk and what you said. Um, uh, James is always my conscience, uh, he sits on my shoulder and is uh, just a wealth of incredible information. Um, we're very lucky to have him sharing the uh, Climate and Nature Partnership. Um, right, so this first slide, I thought it'd be useful to kind of just take a look at the context of this uh, over a slightly longer time period. Um, so this is Herefordshire Council's uh, net zero journey, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. With, and, I, and I actually dug out a, a document which goes back to 2006, which was the 2020 vision, which is here, which was aligned with the, with the then uh, benchmark of 60% reduction by 2050. And we're now looking at net zero by 2030. Um, we've come a long way. We're doing pretty well. Um, but Heritage Council is actually currently um, ahead on the flight path to achieve 75% by 2025 26. Um, we were the first council to uh, put all of our street lighting to LED, for instance. We've, we've rolled out a lot of solar panels and uh, 
things of that nature on leisure centres and schools to reduce that. Um, we've got, uh, I think, across the, the council estate, um, we, we, we're generating more than one megawatt. Um, so we're, we're obviously still a way to go. And I, and I think the thing with this is that the, the, the lower it goes, the harder it gets. Uh, and we have to be prepared for that. Um, but we're, we're very determined to, to get where we need to go. So, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that uh, anyone who knows me will know uh, occupies a great deal of my time and um, is a real passion of mine is water quality. Um, you'll know that we do have a problem with the water quality in the River Lug and the Y and the Clun, um, as indeed many rivers nationally uh, have got a problem uh, with us. It's nutrients principally um, land-based or, or from uh, diffuse agricultural sources. Um, one of the economic impacts that this has had has been to uh, put a halt on housing delivery in the lug catchment, which is um, desperately unfair since new housing actually accounts for something like 0.023%, um, de minimis amount of the problem, but the um, that they get caught up in the the legal net, as it were. Um, so we've we've been we've had to put in quite a lot of time, effort, energy to mitigate that. But I'm very pleased with the mitigation that we've come up with. It's a UK first. I think it might be a world first. But the great thing about it is it's a nature based solution. It doesn't involve chemicals or anything else. A nature based solution, and will bring also other benefits like biodiversity, which is great. And we're looking to do more of that. Um, and and the the first one, the Luston, is is up for uh, for a war, for an award for environmental services, which is brilliant. Um, I also chair the Riverwide Nutrient Management Board, and so therefore I'm kind of you know, twin-hatted, and I'm on the Cabinet Commission as well. Uh, each of these uh, grouping, they have kind of distinct functions. Um, the, the Nutrient Management Board uh, is, is there to um, see the plan to uh, improve the quality of the Y, uh, the Cabinet Commission is more politically aligned, uh, and it's great for me to have conversations with uh, my equal opposite numbers in other uh, neighbouring uh, authorities, because obviously the, the river doesn't know it's flowing across a boundary. It just doesn't, you know, it's a river. We need to think like the river and just flow. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, so one of the jobs that the council has really is is collaboration, and I think that sort of, in a sense, reflects as well with the climate and nature partnership, um, trying to stimulate conversations and get everyone to work together towards the same end, uh, whether that's improving water quality uh, or, or delivering um, retrofit and uh, climate change adaptation, farm audits. You know, almost everything we do requires a degree of collaboration, and uh, it's important that we uh, not only collaborate within the county with partners in the third sector, but also we look at uh, best practice outside, and, and and we learn from that, and we take from that because we want to be uh, the best that we can be, um, and and be able to deliver uh, as many uh, good projects as as we can to um, to respond to the climate and ecological emergency. Uh, next slide. And yeah, and the other thing, obviously, um, mitigation is is tremendously important, and, and we're not going to lift our foot off that pedal. But we also have to be realistic, and uh, as a local authority, we have responsibilities uh, for our residents to ensure that they are safe and prepared, and therefore we need to have an eye to adaptation, whether that's an adaptation. Uh, in terms of physical structures and buildings, um, planning, um, flood resilience, natural flood management, you know, we we have to make sensible predictions about what we think is going to happen and, and make sure that our residents are prepared and protected against those, uh, you know, a, 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 as that as that might occur for, as a result of climate change Um and, and the changes that may come forward. Um, it's a really important thing. And therefore, I think James mentioned that we have the strategy come forward that the uh, Climate and Nature Partnership were consulted over, uh, try and get that right, um, because it's a really important element of the work that uh, that, that we're doing. We, we try to uh, prevent, but sometimes you also have to prepare. Um, and I think, is that is that it? Or is there another slide? I have no idea. <gasps> Questions and feedback.
that. There we go. And that's my department, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks. much, Alyssa. And we must move really quickly into the Q&A. Um, we can go over slightly, but I'm aware that lots of people need to get back to work. So um, I'll start with a, um, a general question, which is from Sally Webster, uh, saying, what role can parish councils play in all of this? And I'd like to address that, if possible, to um, Councillor Spinglehurst. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, do you know what? Really good question. Um, parish councils can declare their own emergency. They can they can do at a parish level an amazing number of things. I'm very fortunate in my ward that that um, in a, at least one of my parish councils has completely gripped this. They've got a great environmental group. They're doing local recycling. They've got a repair cafe up and running. They host seminars and talks. They're doing a lot to raise awareness in their area. Doing litter picks. Um, and uh, and looking at uh, giving people good advice about uh, food and about heating. So parish councils, absolutely, they can do a great deal. And could yeah, I just ch ch chip in, Jackie, to say that in addition, parish councils have a biodiversity duty and the local council's um, oversight body has issued some fantastic guidance um, to parish councils to how they can implement that duty. I think one of the things we could do is make that link available on our website. I know a number of parish councils are already aware of it, but um, they now have a duty to consider and to act. Thanks, James. And also just to say that the, um, uh, that Herefordshire Green Network's Great Collaboration Herefordshire is also um, linking with um, the council and resources to try to pass that on to the parish councils that we're supporting. Um, we've got a couple, we've got a few questions obviously on land management. I'd like to jump to the one from Tom Tibbetts, if I could, um, which is about introduction of horticulture, by which I assume you're meaning very small-scale food production, Tom. Um, what opportunities there are there um, for, for new entrants, essentially? Is that something you've got a view on, James, or is part of our planning? I, I do have a view, but I think it, I, I'd very much like to hear from Steve on this. But yes, there are a number of... It, I, I mentioned the ratio. Um, if we grow more crops uh, to feed us rather than to feed animals, um, there is a clear link um, in relation to calories and land use and land area that provides the basis for the shift that we need to see without threatening food security. That's clear in the evidence in the Dimbleby Review, the National Food Strategy. It's clear in DEFRA's UK Food Security Report of 2021. It's clear in the Climate Change Committee's recommendations. So there's a broad consensus at a scientific level of, but what um, about here in here in Herefordshire, James? What well, about that, here in Herefordshire, the opportunity for people to... Herefordshire enter, is not... A, I said it once, I'll say it again. Herefordshire is not immune uh, to national data sets. Um, Herefordshire is one of 48 counties. That national picture applies locally here, undoubtedly, albeit we have a rather larger percentage of farmland. So... So small scale horticulture that is producing crops for people. We can all think of examples of where veg boxes are being produced and circulated locally. We have one in Ledbury, jolly good. I should be seeing him on Saturday at the Helen's Food Market, Produce Market, and no doubt buying my stuff from him. It's possible. And it's part of the shift that needs to happen. Great, thank you. And I'm sure Rebecca would probably have more to add to that. Um, you mentioned that Steve might want to say something on that, but I've got a specific question for you, uh, Steve, from uh, David Gillam, um, about the phosphate saturated nature of our farm farmland. James would also have strong views on this. Given that, is there um, any good reason at all why um, animal manure, or I suppose digestate, would be spread on our land. So, Steve or 
James to answer that, please. Steve, go first. Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, phosphate saturated soil is um, an emotive term, possibly. Um, most farmers are testing their soils. Can you hear me, James? I can see you. Yep. Yeah, good. Um, most farmers are testing their soils and for the majority of crops, there is a level that you, of phosphate, available phosphate in the soil that is recommended. And under the farming rules for water, uh, to apply phosphate over those levels is not needed um, and shouldn't be done. However, if you want to build up carbon and you want to build up soil fertility, animal manures have a great place to play, a great place in that they will help soils to increase their organic matter and therefore sequester carbon. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but one hopes that soils aren't saturated in phosphate. Um, I think up until about five years ago, it was assumed that a, a soil with a indices, an Olson P indices of a, a mid two, or even a three did not leach phosphate in drain water the way that nitrogen does. But it's it's since been proven that um, certainly soils at levels index three will leach, uh, will leach phosphate in the water. It's not just how long to the, the clay particles in the brown water that we see when we have a lot of flooding. Um, so yeah, there isn't a, a need other than a few crops to apply phosphate above uh, an index two. And um, I think 80% of Herefordshire soils are at three or below. There are some fours and fives around, and some of those are historically hop yards. Some of them are because um, chicken manure has been spread um, year on year, uh, primarily for the nitrogen. Um, but the phosphate was was there, and that was is now bad practice and does not should not happen. And the EA, uh, the regulators, need to enforce the rules. Um, so that's that's where we are. That'd be my answer. As I hope that helps. Thank thank you very much. I think we'll take one other farming question. Um, Jonathan Lloyd has asked, how does the fact that mixed farming is showing to be more carbon efficient in this county than arable farming, how does that fit with the mission to reduce numbers of livestock? Well, no idea. Is, uh, can Steve or James uh, come up with something there? Can I Do you want to start, James? Yeah, thank you, Steve. I'll chip in briefly. Can I also just say that Steve and I are, are, are as one on, on the points he made in response to the phosphate. I'm going to answer the livestock one um, from a similar perspective. We must not look at the problems of carbon, nature and nutrient as silos. We must look at them as an integrated trio of challenges for the county. So we are going to need livestock for the reasons that Steve has said, to maintain soil structure, to increase infiltration, um, and to provide fertility. We're going to need livestock to eat. No one of, other than, and for all sorts of the right reasons, personal choices, um, those who are vegetarian or vegan don't want to eat meat. Personally, I still do eat meat. I just don't eat very much of it. Um, and we're going to need to have meat in our diet for the foreseeable future. So we need livestock for that, we need livestock for soils, and critically, we need livestock for nature. Even in the most wild and rewilding sites, there are livestock. Um, so livestock has a place for, you know, I, I, I cannot envisage a scenario in which the county will not have considerable numbers of livestock. I think we will see a shift in livestock type. There may be fewer sheep and probably fewer cattle. And personally, I would hope fewer chickens, 
but that's an emotive issue too. Steve. Uh, yeah, I think to try and answer Jonathan's point, and he, he probably knows better than me the answer to this, but um, for those mixed farms, uh, arable and livestock are using a lot of the, the produce that they grow on their farms to feed their livestock. They're not exporting that produce. And, and um, grass grows 365 days a year. It takes in sunlight 300, and when there is some at this time of year, it takes it in year round. And so it is capturing carbon from uh, the atmosphere all the year round, where, um, you know, it's argued deciduous, some deciduous woodland only captures it for six months of the year. Um, and so uh, some of the measurements for carbon capture with grass actually show it as being a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of extending by another couple of minutes. I know that we've already gone five minutes over, um, but I'm aware there are some questions on um, non-land management uh, related um, subjects too. So there's a couple about buildings. I don't know whether any of our um, board members um, are here from the building subgroup. Uh, if so, please wave. Are you here, Ellie Deacon Smith? I can't tell. Anyway, there's one asking um, about the um, of whether um, building materials are taken into account. Um, I think, sorry, whether the embedded carbon in building materials is taken into account. Um, when um, building quality is assessed. If we haven't got Ellie there, I think I'll say, um, no, that would be a national issue. I, I don't believe, unless one of the council members or team uh, tells me otherwise, that that's part of any um, supplementary guidance in Herefordshire at the moment. Um, but it's certainly something I think that the building subgroup is very aware of and one of the things that we're now proposing for um, building retrofit is that rather doing than doing deep retrofit absolutely immediately on every on, on a few houses we try to do lighter retrofit on more and a switch to lower carbon heating so that we get those immediate carbon wins um, let me just check again we've got another question um, which is on um, the timing of the consultation of the local plan. Is anyone able to answer that question, please? When is the next um, consultation going on? Uh, yes, it's coming um, Reg 18. Sorry, it's Alyssa. Um, it's, it'll be at Reg 18 consultation. Uh, I think it's the 25th of March it's coming out. So any minute now. Well, next month. Uh, anyway, now I'm that's sorry, great. I have to, I have to go now. I've, got, I've got a cabinet meeting now, so thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Alyssa. Good. Bye. Grand. So uh, we have not, of course, managed to answer all of the questions. When does anybody ever? But um, we are still open for questions. So you'll see the slide there, um, climate at herefordshire.gov.uk. If anyone's got any questions to address specifically to the council, please send them there. And if it's to the Climate and Nature Partnership Board, please email um, questions there and they'll be forwarded to us. Um, so I think I will now just thank everybody for attending. Thanks for taking time. Thank you for your interest in what's going on. Um, we haven't got everything answered. That's the nature of it. Thank you also to all of our speakers, um, Steve, Rebecca, um, and James in particular, and Richard. Uh, who keeps everything rolling for us. Great. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, we will be sending you a recording, uh, a link to the recording, um, and you will also be circulated the slides. Thanks, everybody.